today, as I wrap up our Acts series, or at least my part, Pastor Ken will be next week, uh, I want to share the next practice, which is to search the scriptures, to search the scriptures. I wanted to go big for my final message with you, and I wanted to ask, uh, uh, I've been praying, like, Lord, help us understand what searching the scriptures really mean. And so if you have your Bible, turn over to Acts chapter 17. We're going to continue on in our study of Acts as we wrap up our series next week. But I wanted to talk about a few, or a few moments. There's this incredible group of people uh, from a place called Berea that they're only known for one thing in the Bible. In Acts chapter 17, we read this in verse number 10. It says, As soon as it was night, the brothers and sisters sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. Upon arrival, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, I love this next phrase because it just shows us that imperfect men and women, uh, men wrote God's word. And we find this in verse number 11. It says this. This is Luke writing. He says, The people here in Berea were of more, more noble character than those in Thessalonica. Have you ever been to a couple places and you compared them? You're like, oh man, I went to San Francisco and then I went to San Diego and oh man, there's a lot of differences. Some of you do that with Palmdale and Lancaster. You need to knock it off. We're one community. <laughs> no one's better. Jesus loves us all. But it's kind of like Luke is like, uh, man, we were in Thessalonica, and then we went to Berea, and I hate Thessalonica. Like, I, just like Luke was saying that, like, the Bereans, way better people. Thessalonians, eh, take them or leave them. But Luke, he's going on to saying, he's like, these people that were in Berea were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica because they receive the word, God's word, with eagerness and examine the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Now, the only thing that we know about these people called the Bereans is that they searched the scriptures daily. Now, we need to understand something. They did not have all 66 books of the Bible in this time. They weren't reading Galatians or Ephesians or First and Second Thessalonians because they didn't have those books because they weren't written yet. You know what they did have? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You know, it's the books that we like to skip at the beginning of the year. Leviticus 25, skip, not doing that one. Numbers 13, a whole list of people, skip, don't want that one. Like we just like to skip all the things that the Bereans were searching for daily, which really, if you can find something in Numbers, like you can find something anywhere in Scripture. But the Bereans, they were searching the Scriptures daily, and Paul was teaching, and they were writing it down, and they were like, okay, let me go make sure that that's what I read in the Scripture. And they were kind of making sure that the message matched up. And, and Luke, actually, this doctor, he's not a pastor. He's not a missionary leader. He's just this guy who's following along, charting out Paul's missionary journeys in, in the book of Acts. And he's like, man, these guys are more noble than the Thessalonians because they love God's Word. Word. So in verse number 11, we find that they uh, were examining the scriptures. But look at verse number 12. Consequently, many in Berea believed, including a number of the prominent Greek women, as well as men. But when those pesky Jews from Thessalonica, the Thessalonians that Luke didn't really love, found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul of Berea, they came there too, agitating and upsetting the crowd. So what happened was, Paul, as many of you know, when you share your faith with people, it's not always received with a red carpet. You don't walk into work saying, I'm here to tell about Jesus. And everyone's like, tell me more. <laughs> people are like, are you serious? Like, it's a Monday. Let Relax. I don't want to hear that right now. And so, you know, maybe, maybe Thanksgiving is going to come and you're going to see family that you're like, Jesus, help me. I haven't seen them since last Thanksgiving and it's going to be a rough Thanksgiving. They're not openly wanting you to talk about Jesus. That's how Paul felt, where he was like, I I'm going in. I I'm, last, last week we looked at living as usual. I'm going to go back into the synagogue. I'm going to share the word of God. And not everybody was loving what Paul was doing. And so what happened in this rest of the story is that they actually, the Bereans, put Paul kind of escorted him in hiding and they, they put him out on the back so that he wouldn't be captured by the Thessalonians. And so what uh, we find in this story is we find this group of men and women who the one thing they're known for is they searched the scriptures. I was thinking about that this week. I was like, man, what is the one thing that the Highlands could be known for? 
I was like, I was thinking about, man, would the, maybe people think of like the highlands are like, man, you got to park on gravel over there. Man, they wear hoodies over there. Man, when you go to the highlands, like they just, you know, they're kind of spread out. Like, oh, I don't know, like what's going on? But can you imagine if people in our community was like, man, when I think of the highlands, I don't really know a lot about them. I don't really know what's going on, but they love Jesus. They put on their wall, they search the scriptures, they have people all over the place in life groups and Bible studies, like, I don't know what's going on, but they're led by the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine that my prayer is in 2025 that our church would be known like the Bereans, that we are guided by the Bible. Now, today, I, I was going to nerd out a little bit and talk about the Bereans and some of the history there, but I'm like, no, let's go practical. How do we search the scripture? And what I love about the Bible is that it talks about itself a lot. And so the Bible actually describes itself in three pictures that I want to share with you for just a few moments today that I'm believing that one of these objects you need to search the scriptures has in your life as we move into the end of this year into the beginning of next year. In fact, I want to jump around the scriptures today and look at how the Bible describes itself. And so the first one we're going to jump into is the book of James. James chapter one, here's how this guy, James, the half-brother Jesus, describes the Bible. In verse number 22, he says this, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. What James is reminding us, he's saying, hey, there are two actions that you need with God's word. One is to hear and one is to do. But how many of you know hearing the Bible is much easier than actually doing the Bible? You're hearing the Bible today. I'm so glad that you're here. But hearing is the easy part. Do you know what's hard tomorrow to do it at work? Tomorrow to do it at Thanksgiving with that family member that you're just like, why are they here? Hey, by the way, one thing we are known for here at the Heinz is we're honest with each other. Like we're like, this is it. This is who we are. But many times we, we, we struggle with the doing of the Bible, but we are great at the hearing. So James is like, hey, if you're just hearing and you're not doing anything, you're deceiving yourselves into thinking that you're a good person or that you're a follower of Jesus because you're really not. You're just hearing the Bible. So then he goes on to say in verse number 23, because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like someone, and here's our object, looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes his way, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. You see, if we're going to search the scriptures, the first object we can look at is we search the scriptures. Number one has a mirror. And what does that mean? It means that we change what we see. Now, I was excusing the 8.30 service because it's early for them, and I don't know if they looked at a mirror. I don't say that has judgment. I'm just saying that has a fact. Like, you got to get kids ready. It's, it's chaos. This is the 10 o'clock service, looking nice and pretty. You're ready to go. You had time to look at a mirror for most of you. That is some judgment. No, I'm just kidding. But can you imagine going to this mirror? I'm not allowed to move this mirror, by the way, because they adjusted it just right where it's not supposed to reflect in too many people's eyes. But what I love about this idea of the Bible as a mirror is that I think all of us went into a mirror today, whether it's a full-length mirror or maybe a bathroom mirror, and how many of you know you saw some things that you needed to change this morning? You woke up, you're like, dear Lord, <laughs> what happened? Was I in a fight of my life last night? Like, what is going on? And you saw some things for us, fortunately, that you're like, all right, I'm going to correct. I'm going to fix. I got to clean my, my I got to wash my face. I got to brush my teeth. I got to shave. I got to, ladies, I don't even know what you do. Like, you put layers or foundations or stuff on your face. I don't know. I have three ladies in my house, and I still don't know all that stuff. Like, I try to plead ignorant because i that's too much for me. So ladies, whatever you do to get ready, you saw in the mirror some things that you needed to fix. And so James is reminding us and saying, hey, you look in the mirror to change your physical appearance. You need to look in the mirror of God's word to change your spiritual appearance. Now, here's what you need to understand about the mirror. Now, you're not going to like what I'm about to say, but you'll enjoy Pastor Ken's message next week, okay? So here's, here it is. This mirror only tells the truth. 
Some of you looked in the mirror, you're like, that can't be. The mirror said it. Where did this come from? The mirror told you. This mirror doesn't, unless you get those trick mirrors, slimming mirrors, like make me look better than I really am mirrors, like this mirror is designed to just tell you what it is, like, and you got to deal with it. You know what the same thing happens with God's word? This book, it just tells you the truth. You're struggling with something and you're like, I don't really like what the Bible said to me. It's because it told you the truth. Because when we look in the perfect law of liberty that we read in scripture or the Bible has a mirror, God's word is only exposing to us that which is true. It's not trying to trick you. It's not trying to get you to do something, to kind of manipulate you. It's just saying, here's who you are. Here's what it is. You got to do something about it. You see, when we look into the Bible as a mirror, we change what we see. What this mirror does is it tells us the truth, but it also tells us areas that we can work on. And so when we look at this Bible, it's saying, man, like, I just, I just feel like I just get angry so much. I just feel like I'm, I'm struggling with lust. And we read this Bible and we're like, wait, just because I didn't commit the physical act of adultery, Jesus is telling me that if I lust after a woman in my heart, I've committed adultery there too? Wait, just because I didn't physically kill anybody, but I have anger towards him in my heart, I'm committing murder in my heart? Like, and we read God's word, we're like, man, I got things to fix. I, I, got, I got some work to do. Because this Bible is not trying to manipulate you, this Bible is just telling you what is actually there. One of the reasons that we don't search the scriptures like we ought to is because we're afraid of what it's going to tell us. And I want to encourage you, search the scriptures. Search the scriptures. Uh, What I love about this, and we find this in, um, we read this in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We have another reference to a mirror, and Paul is writing this to the church at Corinth, and he says this, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And then he says this in verse 18, We all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. You see, when you look at the mirror of God's Word, you're actually ultimately not going to see yourself you're going to see the image of Jesus. You see, when you search the scripture, when you allow God's work to do the hard work of your life, and, and, and we're going to talk about this in a moment, but kind of pierce you and share some things with you that you need to change, you're not becoming a better version of you. You're becoming more like Jesus. See, that's the difference between what we preach in churches and what self-help books teach as well, is they're just helping you to become a better version of the sinful you. We're trying to tear us down to the studs and say, Jesus, you build us back up because we don't want to be better versions of me. I don't want you to be a better version of Jeremy. I want you to be, I want you to be like Jesus. And as we search the scriptures, we say, Jesus, how can we be more like you? Now, we see the Bible has a mirror, but I got to be honest with you. It's the second object that I've been most excited about because we see the Bible has a sword. I've always thought, how can I bring a sword into my messages? And (laughs) I think one of my uh, 2025 New Year's goals is going to be preaching with a sword more. Like, this is pretty awesome. I love this, and I'm not bringing this sword up just because I thought it'd be cool. It's actually in Scripture. If you have your Bible or look over in Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12, it says this. It says, For the Word of God is living and effective and sharper than any two-edged sword— penetrating or piercing as far as a separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You see, when you search the scripture has a sword, you need to listen to what you hear. Now, I love this thought because, uh, you know, physical swords like this one are meant to attack somebody. Like, we, we don't just have a sword. We're like, yeah, like, could you imagine if you're going to a store tomorrow and someone's carrying a sword around? Like, you would be like, kids, come with me. We're going over there. Like, call, call every scanner. Let them know what's, there's a guy with a sword. Like, what's going on? Like, I mean, it, it's weird. Like, we wouldn't walk around with a sword because a sword is meant to attack. But I want you to know that the sword of God's word is actually not meant to attack. It's meant to pierce. And here's what I mean. It means that if the mirror shows you some things you need to work on, maybe outwardly or maybe externally, God's word is meant to show you some things on the heart. 
there are some things that you and I don't see from each other that you need to work on. You know what's amazing is we don't have a, a way to view our hearts. Sometimes we know our actions will share what's in our heart. And, you know, like you, uh, you know, bust your finger on with a hammer and some words come out of your mouth that are not worshiping Jesus. And you're like, where did those words come from? Well, they were in your heart. Like they didn't just pop out of mid-sentence of like, oh, I've never heard those words in my life. Like, no, it's out of the heart. The mouth speaks. But when we see the Bible has a sword, what happens is God's piercing us to nail some areas in our life that we need to fix internally. When you blow up at your kids because they were late to the car for school, you're like, whoa, it's not about blowing up at my kids. It's like, what's in my heart? When you escape an experience at work where you're like, whoa, I almost went too far with that woman or with that man. Like, that's a reflection of what's in your heart. You see, the word of God is this sword that pierces, that penetrates because our heart, by the way, is not good. I know the world says, follow your heart, follow your dreams, like Disney princesses are like, let's do it, your heart's amazing. Well, the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 17, verse nine says, uh, no, your heart is desperately wicked. <laughs> your heart is evil. So if you're, if you're following your heart, you're following an evil, desperately wicked person. Welcome to the Highlands. <laughs> but what's interesting is that our heart is wicked and our heart is evil, but God wants to change your heart. You see, we're not perfect, but if we're on our way to following Jesus, God's gonna do some things in our heart and we're allowing the word of God to pierce us and say, whoa, you need to, there's some anger issues right there. I, you see that spot and you're like, oh, it hurts God, but oh, oh. God's like, you need to fix that. No. In Ephesians chapter six, Paul, Paul tells us that the sword uh, of the spirit is the word of God. And that is this idea of attacking the enemy. But here's the problem. And I say this because of, we're coming up into Thanksgiving and some of you love to attack people with the Bible. <laughs> you just feel like that pumpkin pie is gonna taste better if you just get in your little dig with the Bible, your uncle or your sister, you're just gonna attack them. In Ephesians chapter six, Paul reminds us that our enemy is not flesh and blood. However you voted, your enemy is not the opposite party. Your enemy is not someone you can see. Your enemy is against the powers and principalities of this world. You see, Jesus, when he was being attacked by the devil and he was being uh, treated to this, uh, if, devil was just, if you do this, I'll give you this. Do you know what Jesus did every single time? As it is written, he attacked the enemy with the sword. Your enemy is not your uncle. It's not your grandpa. It's not somebody at your family gathering. So don't attack them with the sword because there's an enemy far greater that you and I need to say, hey, enemy, devil, get back. Has it, as it is written. And the only way we know that is if we study God's word. Some of us might need to know the Bible has a sword. We need to listen to what God's speaking to us. Maybe there's some deep heart work in our life. Maybe you're going, or you need to go through emotionally healthy spirituality, or you need to find some time to meet with a pastor or join a life group. And what I love about our Bible studies and our life groups is that we don't just have in passing on Sunday, like, oh, see you next week. No, we're gathering together weekly and we're, we're, you're seeing where I'm failing and I'm seeing where you're failing and we're keeping each other accountable and encouraged. And we're like, hey, how did it go last week? I know you're struggling with that. And I know you're going through this divorce. How can I pray for you? And I know that you're struggling with your kids and what's going on. And we're able to help you with the thought thoughts and matters of the heart. You see, the Bible is a sword. It pierces us. So what is God doing to pierce you? By the way, I know a sword, physical sword is meant to attack and it's meant to, to maim and to hurt, but that's not what God's word is. It may feel like it's hurting, but ultimately God's wanting you to do, just like we said a moment ago, is for you to look in that mirror and see not yourself, but to see Jesus. You see, the Bible's a mirror, the Bible is a sword, and then we find our final uh, object or illustration in Psalm 119. We find this object in verse 105. David writes, he says this, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. But not only do we see the Bible as a mirror, the Bible has a sword, but we see the Bible has a lamp. Now, this means that you need to go where you're shown. 
I was gonna say you need to go where you're lit, but that means something else entirely in our <laughs> world. So don't go where you're lit. Don't even be lit. Just go where you're shown, okay? That's a whole nother message that we'll have to do maybe in the new year. But here's what David's writing about in our life as I wrap up our time together in this. There's two things that we find from Psalm 119 verse 105. Number one is our life is a path. And you know what? We take steps all the time. Every day is a step. Every month, every year is a step. Now, sometimes there's small steps, like maybe your step, you're like, God, this would be a, an amazing week if I didn't compl complain about my boss this week. And so you're like, all right, I'm going to try to do my best, not complain. So maybe take a baby step. Maybe there's bigger steps coming up. Maybe it's a, it's a step of you're getting married next year, and that's going to be a huge step. Maybe, maybe you already know you're expecting a baby next year. And that's another big step. Maybe like our family, we have a, a daughter going off to college next year. That's another big step. Maybe you have a job promotion or you're lining up a new career. You have a lot of steps, but here's the point. Our life is this path that we take steps on. So how do we know where to go? How do we find our way through the light of the word of God? You see what happens is, and you know, we are, we are um, spoiled in America with all the lights we have. Like we put lights on our house, we put lights in our rooms, like we can do the temperature, the softness, the color. We have all kinds of lights. We get annoyed if a bulb goes out, like we're just like, where's my light? But in the ancient days when this was being written, they didn't have the modern conveniences. In fact, this would have even been more uh, awesome than anything that they had. Like they had these little trays of little oil that they can light really literally one step at a time. They couldn't light the whole house. They just had to say, all right, I'm going to take one step. And it was this idea that you can only go where the light is showing you, and it was only showing you one step at a time. So that's why when we read the steps of a righteous person are ordered by the Lord, it's the same thought that we say, all right, God, what step do you want me to take? Okay, I'll take it. God, I... I don't know what to do with my kids. I don't know what to do with my marriage. I don't know what to do at work. I'm not, I have this health diagnosis. What should I do? What, what step should I take? Okay, I'll take this step. And what's happening is step by step, we're relying on God's word to light the way. But do you know what happens when we put ourselves in trouble? We throw out the light and we're just like, I don't need that. I know where I'm going. And then we like hit a brick wall. Or then we stub our toe, which is the worst. But spiritually, it's even worse than that. Like, or we go a different path that God's like, I wanted you over there. Why are you right here? Well, I was lighting my own way. You see, when we read God's word has this light, what he's saying is, step by step, I will guide you. I will lead you. Are you willing to follow? I'm going to close with this last passage we find in Proverbs chapter 6, where it says uh, Solomon is writing some instructions to his son. And he says in verse 20 of Proverbs chapter 6, he says, My son, keep your father's commands and don't reject your mother's teaching. Always bind them to your heart. Parents, we need to make sure that God's word is on our kids' heart, that we are reading an age-appropriate Bible to them or devotional. We are putting God's word in their heart. We're binding it to their heart, tying it around their neck. Verse 22, it says, when you walk here and there, these words, God's word will guide you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. When you wake up, they will talk to you. But here's the key verse in verse 23. For command, God's command is a lamp. Teaching is a light and corrective discipline is the way to life. What Solomon's writing to his son and to us is make sure that you have a lamp of God's word lighting your path. So here's my question, church. As we close out this year, as we close out this year and believing that God has incredible things to come. In fact, I can't wait. One of my favorite services of the entire year is our New Year's Eve service. We're gonna do baptisms. We're gonna do communion together, pray together, Lord's table together. But I have, a, I have a key verse for 2025 that I believe God shared with me that I cannot wait to share with you that's gonna guide us into the new year. I'm gonna share that on New Year's Eve. Uh, make sure you come. It's gonna be an incredible service. Kids have a party until... Uh, Midnight. I say kids because everyone's a kid to me because I'm in my 40s, but teenagers have a party till midnight. It's going to be an incredible night on New Year's Eve. But what I love about this church is that you as a church, you as God's people, you are known, I believe, for searching the scriptures. But that doesn't mean that we avoid the mirror, ignore the lamp, put down the sword. We allow God's word to continue to speak to us Again, not so that you'll be a better version of you. That's not the goal. 
so that you will be like Jesus. And so let me encourage you, church, as we've been in the book of Acts for a year, the final act that I'm going to give to you, the principle, the practice, is to search the scriptures. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we wrap up our time together? And I want to ask you of a mirror, of a sword, of a lamp, what object is most meaningful to you or most impactful to you? And how do you need to view the Bible? I had somebody after our last service that was asking for a Bible to recommend because they want to get into the Bible. Maybe that's where you need this week, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into your Bible. I'm going to do two days, three days, four days this week. I'm going to read it, maybe for the first time all year. God's Word is so incredibly important because it helps you to change what you see. It helps you to understand what you're doing in your heart, but it also lights your path and guides your steps. And so let me encourage you, church, to be like the Bereans who search the Scriptures daily. Maybe you're sitting here in this room or maybe you're watching online and you have never made that decision to say yes to God. And what we mean by that is you have never asked God to forgive you of what you've done. We're not here to shame you. We are a very imperfect church. We are a church where it is okay to not be okay. But we also don't want to stay there because we believe Jesus is not just the reason for Christmas, but is the reason for living. And so I want to ask you, maybe there's people in this room you were invited by a friend or you found us online or you came uh, because you just wanted to check out what was going on. And maybe you're sitting here, you've never made that decision to say yes to God. I, want to be, I don't want to be melodramatic, but I want you to know that that is the most important decision that you will ever make in your life because it determines where you spend your eternity. And you can join the over 1,000 people already this year that have said yes to God through the efforts and ministries of this church. And I want to encourage you today as we enter the end part of this year, that you would go into that part knowing and following Jesus. And it starts with a simple prayer. Is there anybody in this room that would say, I won't embarrass you, I won't ask you to stand or come forward, or I'm not gonna call out your name or embarrass you in any way other than to agree with you and lead you into a short, simple prayer. But is there anybody in this room that would say, Pastor Jeremy, I've never prayed that prayer before, but I want to right now. Would you do me the absolute honor of just simply lifting your hand? I won't embarrass you or call you out, but I want to agree with you. Is there anybody in this room that would say, Pastor Jeremy, would you pray for me? I want to say yes to God. I see you. I see you. I see you as well. I see you. I see you. I see you. I agree with you. I see you in the back. I see you. I see you. I see you. Many hands on my left and on my right, front and the back. I see you over here. I agree with you. Thank you for your honesty. What a bold thing that you're doing. If you're watching online, there were many hands in this room that were raised, that they want to say yes to God. You can join them because our God is everywhere. If you just raised your hand, if you're watching with us online and you want to make this decision, pray something like this. Pray, dear God, thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for me. I know that I've done wrong. God, I know that I'm a sinner, but would you forgive me? Would you come into my life and clean me from the inside out and help me to walk in your ways? Thank you for this gift. Thank you for salvation. And help me to follow you all of my days. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching this message uh, from the Highlands. Our goal here at the Highlands is to become people of the Word. We love the Word of God, and the message you just heard was filled with scriptures that we pray would be an encouragement to you. Make sure that you share if you were encouraged by this message with others to help us get God's Word out. Uh, If you have not yet subscribed to our channel, I want to encourage you. We have messages and content every week that would encourage you and help you grow in your faith. And then make sure you uh, just like this video. And we want to continue to get the gospel out to as many people as we know how to, as we're able to. This is great technology. Thank you for joining us on YouTube. We pray that you're encouraged, pray that you have a great week, and that you would live out what you just heard in your daily life.